Hello, everyone, and welcome to Duke. I want to welcome all the Duke students, faculty, and alumni to tonight's panel discussion on the future of energy. I'm Brian Murray. I direct the Duke University Energy Initiative. The Energy Initiative is Duke's interdisciplinary hub to advance an accessible, affordable, reliable, and clean energy system. We, re we reach across Duke's campus to educate tomorrow's energy innovators, develop new solutions through research, and improve energy decisions by engaging business and government leaders. Today's event explores a few of the big trends shaping the future of energy. It's not intended to be comprehensive. There are numerous other significant developments in the energy space, many of which Duke researchers are also tackling. So we'll just sample some of the key issues that we hope it will provoke and inspire thinking about the many opportunities for innovation and leadership in our sector. The event will highlight insights from Duke experts working on critical issues in energy. At Duke, we have about 130 faculty who are making important strides on energy research from a wide range of perspectives. We often collaborate across disciplines with groundbreaking results. Tonight, you'll be hearing quick talks from just four of them, but please know there are many more brilliant, uh, brilliant minds and brilliant folks working hard on energy solutions at Duke, some of whom are in the audience tonight. I'll quickly introduce each expert and their impressive bios will appear in the chat. And each will spend about seven or eight minutes speaking about a major development affecting the future of energy informed by their own research and expertise. So that's it, that's the, the layout for this evening. And now we're gonna start with Jonathan Phillips. Jonathan is the director of the Energy Access Project at Duke and he's gonna provide some comments on energy access primarily in developing countries. Jonathan. Hi, Brian. Thanks for the intro. Good to see you. Uh, good to be with such a great group for the discussion tonight. Thanks for including me. So I specialize in low and middle income countries uh, where there are upwards of 900 million people still without electricity, another 2 billion people without reliable access. And if you think about the structural inequalities in our global society, the gateways to opportunity, Electricity access is a big one. I'm going to focus most of my remarks on this developing country market, um, but COVID is helping drive one important parallel, at least between these markets and the US right now that I wanna talk about a little bit as well. Uh, so you may know nothing about the state of global energy access, but I bet you're at least a little bit familiar with the, the grid versus off-grid debate. Um, and the argument here goes that the grid is too far from too many people in places in Africa and elsewhere. Incumbent utilities are too weak to be re relied upon to be the, the delivery point. So at, at some point, the revolution in renewables will enable a, a great leapfrogging uh, for off-grid systems that can take advantage of this technology development and which don't bear the cost of transmission infrastructure. Um, and this, of course, would ignite a great competition between grid and off-grid systems for domain of these 900 million or so remaining uh, consumers. Uh, here's where we are in reality. Um, the cost arguments are legitimate. Um, off-grid electricity systems, so when I say that, I'm talking about mini-grid systems, standalone uh, systems, solar and renewables driven primarily. They're the low cost option for connecting 70% or more of those without electricity today. But if we look at where investments are actually going in places with where access is an issue, only about 2% of investments uh, are going to off-grid. So, so you know, we've got 70% where off-grid is the low cost option, but only 2% of investment going. How do we, how do we reconcile this? Um, and the answer is complicated, uh, and it's rooted in an age-old problem. It's the same problem we faced in the U.S. when we electrified in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and that is, you know, poor rural people with low electricity demand generally cannot afford the cost of an electricity connection, no matter how you do it. Um, it requires subsidy. Over the last 60 years or so, we've put um, the capacity in place, uh, institutional capacity, namely through the World Bank, to deliver that subsidy to the point where today, you know, 90% of earthlings are connected to the grid and it's worked very well. 
So transforming that, that financing system to enable private companies to deliver power that might look and smell a little different in terms of, you know, maybe it's not 24 seven power or maybe it doesn't power high capacity equipment. Um, shifting the financial plumbing, so to speak, is not a, a straightforward exercise. But here's my good news prediction of the night. Um, if we're going to get utilities and off-grid companies, um, I should say, I believe we are going to get utilities and off-grid companies sort of on the same team and aligned towards the same goals. Um, the, there's been an adversarial dynamic where sort of mini grid developers try to get as far away as possible from the grid. And I think that's evolving um, quite clearly. And the key has been getting a better handle on the value that off-grid systems uh, provide in building and developing customers. So off-grid companies, you know, generally have really good customer service. They, they answer their phones when you call them and they can probably speak your local tribal language. Um, and they offer additional products like appliances, cook stoves, uh, even cell phones that build electricity demand and, and sometimes even build household uh, income. Uh, and so these are the services that utilities tend to be really bad at providing. Um, but they also happen to be the factors that, that build the type of um, customer that a utility really wants to connect to the grid because they're, they're profit generating rather than loss generating. Um, and there are no other natural synergies here that off-grid systems can provide in terms of you know, backup power, ancillary services. So what I'm getting at is um, a much clearer path forward exists today for an integrated approach to reaching the final billion in which utility and off-grid providers are on the same team for planning together. Uh, I'm seeing some co-branding together um, deploying interoperable systems that are designed for future grid integration. And I think we're still figuring out, you know, the commercial models for how this will be workable. So how do you transfer assets and customers? How do you share subsidy? Um, other really important questions. But, but I think those models and commercial relationships are now being developed and tested in places like Nigeria and Uganda and I think we're going to see replicable models emerging from those experiences. Um, okay, switching gears, I want to throw a big, hairy, provocative question on the table um, because that's what these future of energy conversations are for, right? Um, it's this, is energy access a human right? And if so, what are we going to do about it? Um, we've reached the point where income disparities are so vast that the cost of energy is almost inconsequential to some of us and out of reach for others. Over the weekend, the hot discussion in my house was whether to adopt a leopard gecko that someone on the neighborhood listserv had put on offer. Um, and these leopard geckos are apparently desert creatures, so we would need something like a 100 watt heat lamp to keep this guy comfortable. So that's 876 kilowatt hours per year for the gecko, just for the heat, which is more than six times the amount of power that your average Nigerian uses. And by the way, the, that Nigerian power is probably four times expensive as my power here in North Carolina, because it's, uh, it's coming from a diesel generator, most likely. Obviously, none of this is relevant to my first uh, and fourth graders um, because power cost and availability don't hit the top 100 considerations for whether we get that gecko. And my point is, it's, it's one thing when this disparity um, exists between kind of here and there. Um, but I think COVID and the economic fallout from it has really brought that energy poverty issue to our shores in the US. By October 1st, uh, utility shutoff moratoriums will be voluntary in 36 states, meaning utilities can shut off uh, power for some of the most vulnerable people in America. And about 10 million of uh, uh, people in those states are below the federal poverty line, and almost 10 million people in those states are unemployed. So here's my bad news prediction. We've taken for granted for decades that 
everyone in this country has electricity access, that's an assumption that we need to revisit. Um, this problem is bigger than a, a tiny federal energy assistance program that's in place for low income people. Uh, and I, you know, over the next year, I think energy poverty could really become the newest face of economic inequality in this country. And last point, um, you know, that face has color. Um, black families are twice as likely to have their power shut off as white families. So, um, you know, who would have thought it a year ago? It's the theme of 2020. But um, as this country experiences a massively important racial awakening, energy poverty is, is really a part of that. So, sorry if I went over. Back to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was really, uh, you packed a lot into a very short talk very rich and, and, uh, and thought provoking. So I look forward to the Q&A where we'll be able to dig in on some of those issues. So now we're gonna to move to Dr. Lori Benier. Uh, Lori is the Granger Associate Professor of Energy Economics and Policy and Senior Associate Dean at the Nicholas School of the Environment. Uh, Lori's gonna talk some about transportation, electri electrification and automation. So Lori, take it away. Great. <clears throat> Uh, so Jonathan, we have something else in common, which is during COVID, we, uh, we also acquired a uh, 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 lizard critter. We got a bearded dragon, so we can talk about that at another time. All right, but I'm going to talk with everybody here today, thank you, uh, about electrification and automation in the transportation sector um, as one of the big changes in the next 10 years with respect to uh, energy. So if we think about electric vehicles, um, it's a still relatively nascent part of the car market, but exponential growth is happening and is expected. So according to McKinsey, there were over 2 million electric vehicles sold globally in 2018, which was a 63% increase over 2017. And despite that, it's still about 2% of the light vehicle market. But Bloomberg estimates that by 2030, roughly 30% of new passenger vehicle sales will be electric and that will increase to 56% by 2040. So someone who's born today, by the time they're heading off to college, over 50% of the vehicles sold will be electric. But this is not just happening in passenger vehicles and maybe not even most importantly happening in passenger vehicles, um, but Bloomberg predicts a doubling of market penetration for electric buses and for light commercial vehicles. Um, so there's a lot of growth from a very small baseline still, but the growth is not even across the globe. So China leads the way in both production and demand. Um, Chinese sales of electric vehicles grew 85% from 2017 to 2018. Um, and Bloomberg predicts that China will account for about 34% of the global electric vehicle sales by 2030. The US was a very close second with one year with year-over-year -year growth of about 80%. That was driven primarily by sales of the uh, Tesla Model 3, which was supposed to be the every person's electric vehicle. In contrast, European market share increased by 38%, so significantly less, but some of the highest EV penetration is actually in the small Nordic countries, including Norway, which has about 40% market share for electric vehicles. So in addition to just more increases in market penetration, we're also expected to see significant increases in choice. So if you've been in the market for an electric vehicle recently in the United States, you realize your choices are fairly limited, especially if you live in a state like North Carolina um, that's not a zero emissions vehicle state. Um, you can buy a Tesla, you can buy a Leaf, there's a handful of cars you can purchase, but most of the cars are not available in um, every state in the country. But we're expected to go from about 96 current electric and plug-in electric hybrid models that are on sale to about 511 in 2023. Now, that was pre-COVID number, so we might see a little slowdown in the increase in the number of models that are being offered. Um, but the largest growth was expected in compact small family uh, large family, midsize, and executive and full-size models. So what's been the primary driver of this growth? Battery costs have fallen dramatically, about 84% from 2010 to 2018. And that's the primary uh, factor that drives the cost differential between an electric vehicle and an internal combustion engine vehicle. But Bloomberg predicts parity in costs between these two vehicles by mid-decade. Um, 
what does this mean for energy and the environment? Well, in terms of um, the impacts of energy consumption on the environment, this is mostly good news. Um, the emissions, of course, from driving an electric vehicle are not necessarily zero. It depends on the emissions factors of the generation of the electricity that charges the vehicles. But we're seeing increasing interest in um, solar panels uh, paired with battery storage to allow people to charge overnight um, using solar energy. Um, even if you plug into traditional generation, um, wind power, for example, is highest at night. So if you're plugging in in Texas, you're more likely to be on zero emissions power at, in the evening. Um, and utilities are increasingly seeing this as potentially the saving grace for their business model. Um, and we are seeing this play out in real time. Even in COVID, I had someone recently come door to door, believe it or not, uh, wearing a mask, fortunately, to try to um, sell us electricity as a service. So essentially, uh, the company that they represent, uh, pairs, paired with Duke Energy, which is our local power provider, would own the solar panels on our roof um, and all of the uh, investment tax credits and things that come with that. And we would just pay a lower fee than we pay currently to Duke Power for our electricity uh, from those solar panels. And so we're starting to see an increase in that as well as an increase in, um, in the role of utilities in solar depots for fleets. So in my last two minutes, I'm gonna talk about automation. Um, when you think about automating a vehicle, you usually have this wonderful vision of like just laying back on your iPad while the car is driving down the road. And that is level five automation. And frankly, we aren't gonna be there anytime in the next decade if we're thinking about um, the future of energy over the next 10 years. But we are seeing increases in lower levels of automation, um, many of which are already on vehicles that are for sale today, right? So the blind spot, blind spot warnings and the ability to stay within your lane and the, the adaptive cruise control are all forms of vehicle automation. Um, we are also seeing increasing amounts of automation in the non-passenger vehicle space, which is frankly a lot easier and a lot more likely to happen over the next decade. So auto autonomous buses, particularly that run on, on fixed routes, like airport buses, right? We are likely to see um, significant more of or around college campuses, right? Because they know the routes and they can manage the space better than all of us driving on streets where pedestrian might walk out in front of us, et cetera. What does all this automation potentially mean for the environment? And that really depends on policy choices. So there's an optimistic scenario where people move away from vehicle ownership to shared mobility. You press a button on your phone like for Uber and the right size automated pod shows up to pick you up. Or if you have your whole family, a bigger one comes to pick you up. And we don't have a need for parking anymore. So all of that becomes green space. This is the wonderful world, right? There's a pessimistic scenario for, in terms of the environmental impacts where the cost of driving essentially decreases, right? It's less costly to you to be in the car. So sprawl increases as people move further from work since they can work during their commute. They continue to own their own vehicles so they don't, we don't save on parking. And the transit markets collapse as people can get point to point service at lower cost, um, which leads to more single passenger vehicles on the road. So I'm out of time, but I'll leave more of that discussion about the optimism and the pessimism and what that means for policy for the Q&A. Great, thanks so much, Laura. That was really, uh, really fascinating. So now we're gonna, you know, one of, the, one of the beauties at Duke is we have this interdisciplinary approach to all things energy. So you've been hearing from uh, economists and, and lawyers and whatnot, but it's time to turn to the engineers. So we have uh, Dr. Nico Hotz, He's the Associate Professor of the Practice in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science. And he's gonna be talking some about the diversification of energy sources, storage, and different technological innovations. So Nico, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you all for joining us here. Yeah, I have the very challenging task of talking about energy future from a technological point of view. Uh, I wish I would know what the future in terms of energy is, in terms of what energy sources will be very important and dominant in the future, what uh, technologies will be important if I wish, if I knew that I would maybe not sit in my very pretty office right now. Uh, but I think there are a few trends that are very clear and uh, that I would like to talk a bit about for a few minutes. So I think that to summarize everything, 
diversification is really what's going to change a lot. It's already changing today and has changed for the last few years, but it's going to continue much more changing. And I mean by that, we're going to have a much more diverse set of energy sources that we are using, uh, as well as a much more diverse set of technologies for energy conversion and energy storage that humanity in developing countries as well as developed countries are going to use. More and more energy sources as well as energy related technologies are becoming available in the sense of becoming more commercially competitive. Uh, already today, as probably most people know, uh, solar and wind is fully competitive cost-wise with fossil fuels in certain areas. And I think that's gonna change and improve and, and increase even more in the future. Uh, talking about different technologies, different materials, I think a lot of change has already happened, is continuing to happen with wind. Uh, we're finding, uh, we are finding uh, better materials and better designs to make even bigger wind turbines that generate more power uh, and set them into better arrays, put them into better wind farms, especially off grid. Uh, or in talking about solar, we have started to see more thin film solar cells come onto the market slowly, very slowly. But I think in the next 10 years, there will be much more of those thin film solar cells in 10 to 15, maybe 20 years. Uh, materials will start to be used in thin film solar cells that today we ha are not using at all. That will increase efficiency, that will decrease cost, and will even further make solar power uh, increase worldwide. Of course, at the moment, it's at a very low level, but that trend is very going up very much. Uh, and that will, of course, help the electrification that uh, we heard just before from Laurie as well. Now, I believe diversification means as well that with fossil fuel, with fossil power, decreasing in its importance to some degree, still being very important for the next couple of decades, but slowly starting to lose market dominance and renewable energy is going up. I don't think there's any technology, any energy source that will be able to dominate the market in the near future, or even in the immediate future. So we will not be relying on one or two or three very important energy sources as we have for the history of humanity, but instead go more to a very integrated, very complex, very diverse set of systems. And I think that will help a lot of technologies uh, first to develop them and get to better materials, better ideas, better technologies, uh, but as well to apply them and use them because no technology, no energy source has to dominate the market. We will use in certain areas, certain technologies that are not going to be very used in others. For example, I think that besides solar and wind, fuel cells, hydrogen, alternative fuels, biofuels, thermal, maybe solar fuels, uh, will play an important role, not overall, but in certain areas, maybe even niches, and play overall all together combined an important role in the future. Uh, now with this set of diverse energy sources and uh, technologies and that increase in diversity, uh, we will face a lot of challenges, but as well a lot of promise and a lot of opportunities. I think one of the opportunities is that the amount of energy as well as fuel, electricity, as well as fuel being produced worldwide by local decentralized systems will strongly increase. I have seen predictions that maybe within 10, 15 years in developed countries from currently a few percent of power generation, it might go to a quarter, a third, or maybe even half of all the power being generated coming from small localized decentralized uh, systems. That might be individual consumers, might be individual corporations that are producing their own electricity or their own fuel. Uh, as well as smaller communities or larger communities, entire municipalities. So I think there's gonna be a lot of change and a lot of development in that direction as well. Uh, another driver besides smart grids that we heard about already before that is going to help face the challenges that come with diversification is energy storage. Uh, we just heard before a lot about electricity, electric cars, uh, batteries have, have improved in efficiency and in price drastically over the last five years, five to 10 years. That will certainly continue. But I think we will as well see different types of energy storage, chemical, electrochemical systems. Uh, for example, the hydrogen that already meant, uh, that I mentioned before in combination with fuel cells, but as well flow batteries uh, or different alternative fuels that we're gonna use to store the electric uh, energy uh, in our partly more decentralized smaller systems. And then finally, I guess in my last minute that I've left, it is typically the most interesting 
to do research and as well to talk about like today about new energy sources and new energy technologies. But we must not forget that energy efficiency is extremely important and we really have to work on that just as much as you work on finding new energy sources and better conversion and storage technologies. Right now, any improvement in renewable energy use, for example, is just being used to add more energy to the system because obviously worldwide energy consumption is increasing and has to increase and will for a while. We're not really yet replacing fossil fuel. And so we have to work as well on needing less energy consumption in the world. Uh, today in the US, about two thirds of all our energy input is being wasted. Uh, our efficiency as a whole society is about one third. Uh, and that has to improve drastically for uh, any new technology and new systems to be competitive and really change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nico. Appreciate that. Looking forward to the questions you're going to get uh, in the Q&A sessions. So our next speaker is Kate Kontnick. Kate is the Director of the Climate and Energy Program at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. And she's also a senior lecturing fellow at Duke Law School. And she's going to talk about the complexity of firming up intermittent renewables and other kinds of challenges facing the domestic energy sector in the US. Kate. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was great to see my colleagues, uh, sadly virtually, but this is, this is how we do it these days. Also good to see such a big community online. So hope everyone's having a good Monday. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to actually just build a lot on what Nico was saying and set it in a policy context, because that's sort of where I come from this. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, but thinking about how to create the right systems and the right incentives so that you are solving for some of these problems and you are innovating in the types of products that are delivering electricity for us. So. The policy context I'm thinking of first and foremost is climate change and Nico talked about this about generally the sector getting cleaner um, and some of the fossil moving out that we see a, a future for fossil for uh, some years to come. And I do believe and so I'm starting from the premise here that we are going to be living in an increasingly carbon constrained world. And so when I'm looking at the electricity sector, I'm thinking about it in that way. Um, we also already have readily available technologies in the electricity sector to decarbonize it, if not fully, at least from today's baseline, um, more so than in some other sectors of the economy. So as you start seeing uh, local jurisdictions and states setting 100 percent, you know, sort of carbon neutral targets by mid-century, when that is economy wide, um, we are inherently asking the power sector to do a lot of the early work and a lot of the heavy lifting. And so how would we do that? Um, at the same time, while we're trying to solve for a cleaner grid, we also have these at least three other really important pillars, right? Reliability, affordability, and equity, which Jonathan raised earlier. So it's sort of, you know, how do we know that when we flip our light switch, the power will be there? How can we ensure that it's not a huge chunk of disposable income or total income of a household? And how is it made accessible across income brackets, uh, across uh, classes of customers, and across different socioeconomic demographics? So th this is tough. And as Nico said, there, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know which combination of technologies are going to work together to deliver that grid in the future. Um, Duke Energy has actually come up with this acronym that it's been using in planning documents this year called the ZELFR, the Zero Emitting Load Following Resource. It's this magical resource that does not emit uh, and is fully dispatchable. And in many of their plans, they're sort of just hoping the ZELFR shows up by the 2040s to, to deliver us all. And I, I, I mean that not sarcastically. This is, this is a real, where people are waiting for some big breakthrough. But we have had a lot of breakthroughs and a lot of diversification in the recent years, as Nico alluded to. And so what can we do thinking about policy to build from that? So I'm thinking about five types of policies um, and thought I would throw them out as categories. And all of this is to think about the particular question of firming up renewables. So, you know, wind blows when it's windy, solar, uh, creates electricity when there's sunshine? How do you sort of firm up those resources so you can call on them when you need them? 
And the sort of five big categories, one is R&D or incentives to scale up or deploy these technologies that would help firm up resources. Two, there are policy decisions about opening up the grid to more interconnection. Now that could be physically building more transmission. It could also be reducing artificial barriers between our RTOs and balancing areas. Um, so tariffs, for instance, figuring out how to sort of make it more of a seamless grid. The third category is direct environmental regulation. So ratcheting down on environmental requirements that then either increase the cost of operation for a particular fossil facility or induces it to retire. So you're sort of pushing out coal in particular in recent years. Um, uh, sort of the fourth category is the opposite of that, which would be to require more energy storage or other firm clean energy to be put on the grid, percent, perhaps as a percentage of sales. Um, and that might be like a renewable portfolio standard 2.0, that the percentage of sales that have to come from firm renewables. And then the fifth category of policy is, and this is for Brian at The Economist Speak, would be uh, pricing the externality and just pricing carbon emissions and creating that sort of price differential for those heavier, more carbon intensive uh, units. And what's interesting about a lot of those policies, with the exception of some of the R&D and maybe opening up the, the interconnection of our grid, a lot of those policies are put pressure on this system, this synchronous complex system. So either you know, force earlier retirement of, of otherwise economic coal um, or induce the, the placement on the grid of some of these other cleaner technologies and then sort of hope the market solves for this increased penetration of renewables. Um, and so that's, that, that's the big exciting technical and policy question that we're really grasp, gra grappling with right now. Just very quick issue spotting on what we're doing at the Nicholas Institute in this area is we're leading a stakeholder process in North Carolina to think about how to fully decarbonize the North Carolina grid. Um, cut it 70% from 2005 levels by 2030 and then carbon neutral by 2050. So that's been fascinating. Happy to talk about it in question and answer. We're also involved in a process in North Carolina thinking through the utility business model and whether changes need to be made to that structure, whether it's changing the incentives of the existing utilities or opening up the space to third party participation to solve some of these problems like these integration of renewable problems. Um, we're also thinking about carbon pricing and what that might do. So I'm testifying before FERC in a couple of weeks, thinking through carbon pricing in the electricity markets and what that might do and what are the implications for that. And we're also looking at green banks and other sort of clean energy financing to scale up some interesting technological solutions from the ground up. A last little point as I'm wrapping up here is that a big theme in our stakeholder conversation about decarbonization in North Carolina and in the broader conversation about integration of renewables is the role of natural gas. Um, so you'll see in Duke's latest planning documents, gas is playing a very significant role, at least into the 2040s. And then if these so-called zelfers don't show up, we have to figure out what to do. And so there's a lot of really interesting questions about that that we're starting to think about as well, and many others are too. So you see on the Hill, there are clean energy standard bills, some of which start to contemplate, do we think about the life cycle emissions of different types of fuel sources in the power sector? So if you have a gas plant, does it also have to account for the upstream methane leakage? Um, you've got a lot of just direct regulation that states are doing of methane. Uh, leakage across the system. So a lot of really interesting questions there. And then there's a lot of open questions about what happens as we start to cycle more of our combined cycles and the types of either um, you know, air pollution implications and others for using those power plants in that way to firm up these renewable resources and follow them as they are available. So I will stop there and look forward to questions and answers. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, Kate. That's, that's terrific. Um, now we've been tracking the questions um, in the uh, in the chat room or in the Q and A box, and they've they've been great. They've been uh, they've covered a lot of topics from green hydrogen to hydraulic fracturing to uh, nuclear energy, and we're going to try to hit on as many of those as we can. So um, so what I'm going to do I'm going to I'll start with one here, and so this is this is for Jonathan, uh, and. 
Sorry, the question just moved in my box. So, okay. Um, as to your big hairy question, I think using the word right when you talk about power is dangerous. It sounds like the Attorney Employment Act of 2020. How much power uh, would one have the right to? Enough to power their big screen TV? Hopefully market forces will build the grid micro and macro in impoverished countries to build market for the other items you mentioned. It's worked for cell phone coverage in Africa. Can Lori or someone, well, sorry, I've got another one. Let's just go with that one right now that was switching subjects. So, yeah, it's a, go ahead and take that on. About sure, it's a, it's, a really, it's a really great question. And I, I completely agree that uh, using the word right is dangerous um, because with a right comes a responsibility to uphold that right. Um, so, I mean, as far as, um, you know, what someone could have the right to, I'm less worried about that. I think there are ways of, um, you know, a lot of, lot of states and a lot of countries have, have lifeline tariffs or some minimal amount of electricity that is sold at a discounted rate or, or something that equates to what a minimal level of service is needed to provide uh, or minimal amount of energy to provide a certain kind of service. Um, and, you know, the market for sure is important here, but I, I think it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, the power sector especially ha is, has subsidies embedded all over it. And if we were to talk about electricity access globally, if we were to have purely market forces determining um, capital allocation and who gets connected, uh, it, man, I, I wonder if we would have half of humanity connected. Um, Certainly those upfront um, subsidies that get that initial connection are critical and, and have been for most countries to achieve universal electrification. That's great. Anybody else wanna chime in on that? If, if not, I'll move on to the next question. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try to go in the sequence of our speakers so that they, uh, uh, their voices don't get uh, rusty. So uh, Lori, with the average time people own cars in the US now at 12 years, uh, that means even in 2040, it would seem that the vast majority of cars on the road will still be ICE, internal combustion engines. Unless the carbon tax or market forces make gasoline very expensive or ICE cars illegal, if you were queen for the day, and I know, I know you'd like that opportunity, Lori, um, what PP uh, would you implement to get us there faster? Public policy, PP. What public policy would I implement? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, if we think about the turnover in cars um, and a, even a 10 year life cycle, uh, the vast majority of cars on the road will continue to be internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, and honestly, I think even if, if uh, you know, we could in theory make them illegal. That's not my, that's not my choice, by the way, as queen for the day. Um, there are still need for vehicles that are not currently able to be met by electric vehicles, right? Um, you know, Tesla's about to release its uh, cyber truck, um, but you know, many of my neighbors here in North Raleigh still want their truck or their SUV to haul their boat or to haul things around or to, to hold a larger family or whatever it might be. So um, if I were queen for the day, uh, I'm a good economist. I want to price the carbon emissions from the internal combustion engine. Uh, and I think that would then, you know, help accelerate um, the, the adoption of, of electric vehicles. But I also think if we can um, think about multiple public policies in their intersection, and that's really where the the innovations in on the utility front with the way they're thinking about distributed solar is actually kind of exciting, right? Because instead of just people who can plop down $35,000 for a set of solar panels on their roof and a, another five grand for a Tesla power wall in their garage, you can have somebody else put the solar panels up there and maintain them. And you are still connected to the grid. You're getting the, the electricity from the solar panels to power your car and your home. Uh, and you're paying just a lower rate for your electricity overall, I think that makes renewable energy far more accessible. And that actually also really increases the savings for the electric vehicle over, um, over the internal combustion engine. So a combination of, of you know, pricing the externality, to use Kate's term, and looking at some other policy interventions um, in the electricity space. Thank you, Lori. Um, 
I'm going to throw this one towards Nico. Um, and it was directed at Lori or someone. And I'm, I'm going to I'm going to try Nico um, to if you have anything to say about uh, hydrogen and green hydrogen and its possible use in power generation and fuel cell powered vehicles. Yeah, so when people talk about green hydrogen, often they mean, I don't know if the person who asked this question meant that too, they talk about photovoltaics, using photovoltaic electricity and doing electrolysis with that, splitting water, turning it into hydrogen. That's a perfect system that's completely renewable and works really well, but it is not very efficient and it is therefore not very cheap. So today, almost all the hydrogen in the US and worldwide that we use in the industry today mostly, I hope more in cars, fuel cells, other things in the future, are produced by converting natural gas, so methane to hydrogen. So today, almost all hydrogen that we use is coming from a fossil fuel. So if we would turn that into a green hydrogen, we would need to use some biofuels, biomass derived fuels, and do a similar chemical reaction that converts that fuel into hydrogen. Um, and, and Laurie mentioned before the, the heavy very heavy SUVs or trucks with electric. I personally think that that's, for example, something where hydrogen in the intermediate future, not immediately, but at some point can be really competition to battery powered or electric cars or, or, or heavier vehicles, because that's where it really has a high power density and is very strong for that. Um, so actually, uh, maybe I'll follow up with you on that as well, um, because a lot of people when they when they think about using hydrogen, whether it's green or brown or turquoise, there's actually like lots of different varieties of hydrogen in terms of their uh, carbon uh, footprint. They they often are thinking about say fuel cells and vehicles, and not thinking as much about industrial uses or energy storage. Is there? Can you think about like which type of application seems to have the most promise in the short run? Sorry, was that question directed to me? So wh wh which of the, yes, it was directed to you, Nico. So I mean, um, today, today, almost all of the hydrogen that we're using is for industrial processes, mostly fertilizer uh, production. Uh, so if you're talking about having any form of green or whatever hydrogen today, that would really mostly affect uh, chemical processes. Uh, but I think fuel cells are at the point where they can start to slowly compete with battery or other equivalent technologies. And so I think in five, 10 years, we will start to see more of hydrogen use in transportation or in other processes or other applications. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder, I mean, I think if I'm, I may be wrong, but I think the Nikola um, truck, large scale, long distance hauling trucks, I think is, is looking at hydrogen platforms uh, yes. as well. And I think that's probably the most promising one in transportation. So Kate, I'm going to ask you um, a question about natural gas, something you, you know about. This is, a, this is a big, hairy question, too, and, uh, you know, it might get um, uh, interesting. Um, so due to, due to fracking, the U.S. is the leader in natural gas production. And if you look at greenhouse gas emissions, the reduction in carbon emissions for the last 10 years in the U.S. was largely due to natural gas. It's cheaper, and it's going to be around for a long time. The questioner is not a lobbyist for the industry, but wind and solar aren't going to hack it uh, in the United States for decades to come. So I don't know if there's really kind of a question, but for a comment for you or actually anybody, but I, I think I'd like to start with you because I know it's an area that you've worked quite a bit on, so. Yeah, thanks, great, it, yeah, good comment, always important. I touched really briefly on natural gas because you really can't talk about the decarbonization to date in the power sector or going forward without addressing natural gas. Uh, you're right that in the last 10 years, a lot of our emissions reductions in the power sector are because of the shift from coal burning power plants to gas power plants in really competitive markets like the ERCOT market in Texas. I mean, you see coal plant after coal plant retiring and in their SEC filings, basically saying natural gas is eating us for lunch. We had no choice but to shut down. Um, so it has played a really critical role. Uh, and natural gas is a flexible uh, fossil resource, so that it's easier to ramp up and down and operate at different levels than a, than a coal plant, which makes it a nicer companion on the grid to these variable uh, renewables. 
Um, I, I would probably take issue, and but I, maybe I should defer to Nico on this, on the fact that wind and solar aren't going to cut it for decades to come. I think given the, the precipitous drop in storage and the fact that there's um, better wind modeling and sort of just generally renewables modeling over larger footprints now that suggest if we do have a, a you know, much bigger uh, footprint, you can actually balance some of these intermittent resources against one another. So I think there's an open conversation to be had there. But gas is uh, definitely a major player right now. And even in the, the International Energy Agency, when they look at their sort of Paris compliant emissions reductions targets from 2050, and a lot of industry dings the IEA uh, as being sort of too rosy um, in their views of, of like where we'll be with decarbonization technologies. But even so, they show a really healthy market share for oil and gas still in the mid-century. But it assumes virtually no leaking of methane anywhere across the value chain, which is frankly, particularly in the US today, not a reality. So I think there's a real conversation to be had about reducing that leakage and reducing the sort of overall CO2 equivalent intensity of oil and natural gas. And then I do think we also should look at the other end uses of natural gas because only about a third of it ends up in uh, power plants. But thanks. Thanks a lot, Kate. Um, here's a question for Lori. Lori, do you see any unconventional players entering the electric car manufacturing space? For instance, Apple is now a, a $3 trillion company but makes only consumer electronics, which could quickly become obsolete. I could see a breakout player similar to Tesla. Uh, but better capitalized, quickly capturing market share. Any thoughts there? Yeah. So uh, this this person should should um, should buy some stock, I guess. Um, I think it's entirely possible, and the reason it is, although I wouldn't predict it, I guess I wouldn't put my money on it, is because the the increasing amount of automation combined with the electrification makes the vehicle more like a computer with wheels than with like a traditional automobile. Um, and there's some issues with that, actually. There's actually a lot of interesting policy issues with how we regulate cars and the extent to which that model that we've developed over time for, you know, really machinery with engines that can't be updated over the airwaves um, has to shift in the presence of a computer with wheels that can be updated over the airways. Um, so to the extent that we continue to see, it, it's not really the electrification as much, although it helps, but the automation, right? And the software driving the entire system um, and the need to update that software regularly as the computers are learning more about how to drive safer. Uh, I think you're gonna start to see software players being huge. And they already are in the background, but being even bigger players. I mean, it, it, it's um, in some sense easier for them to adapt their model to building cars than for the traditional car manufacturers to adopt to a software mentality. Great, thanks. Um, one of the questions here was, you know, that no one hit, <clears throat> no one has mentioned nuclear. And um, so there's there are a couple things I'm going to say about that. Um, one is, um, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're only gonna, you know, we're, 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 we have four experts here kind of dealing primarily with their areas of expertise. Um, I will say that um, we actually had a full event on advanced nuclear technology, including some of the small nuclear um, uh, reactor technologies that were alluded to um, in the comments. And it's definitely, I mean, the, the nuclear of old is a lot different than the nuclear of new. And there are some exciting developments that are occurring that could bring down the cost of nuclear, improve its safety, and allow it to act uh, sort of flexibly as a source of, you know, as a way to handle intermittent renewables in certain uh, places. So I don't know, like Nico, or if anybody else wanted to chime in anything on nuclear. Again, no one here is like primarily a nuclear expert, but we do recognize the importance of it. And I, and I will kind of hide behind the original uh, uh, waiver caveat that we weren't going to be able to cover everything. I think there are a lot of very promising and interesting developments in the nuclear industry world, but I think they're high risk research in the sense of it's not clear to me what will work there and what will what can be the future there. And I do not dare to make any prediction there because it's far away from my field of expertise. From a policy perspective, when we're modeling North Carolina, for instance, I mean, we're assuming there's relicensing of all the existing nuclear 
And then as far as getting into sort of next gen, we do price into the model what small modular nuclear could potentially cost. Uh, it's not, the, you know, the model's not choosing those technologies right now, but those are those the sort of small modular nuclear uh, units are among those things that fall in that category that Duke Energy has been calling the Zelfer. So it is this sort of potential technology looming out there. And I, I can just chime in on the, the developing country front. There was another question related to this. I, um, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, low income countries are necessarily the ideal market for eliminating technology risk. Um, if these, if these technologies are commercialized, I think there's, you know, plenty of opportunity for development banks to, to possibly roll them out in places like Africa, for example. But, um, you know, a lot of those financing institutions will take political risk. They will take um, a certain amount of, of sector risk and certainly, you know, credit risk of the institutions that are borrowing to build these capital assets. But not a lot of institutions want to have an appetite for technology risk. So I think we're going to see these scale up in, in developed markets before we're going to see them in, in Africa. Thanks, Jonathan. Again, bouncing all over the place. These questions are great. Um, Kate, I'm going to direct this one to you, which is, do you think there is a role for transmission and decarbonization? And how does that compare to large scale batteries? So I guess uh, you know, it's like it's, it's the old extensive versus intensive margin sort of situation, right? Like you either can integrate the grid by drawing electricity from broader um, geographies or you can do it by having storage right close to the source of intermittent supply. You want to speak to that? And Nico, that also might be something you would want to chime in, in on as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Nico probably has a, has a technical answer to this. I would say from a policy perspective, we should be exploring both. Um, sort of easiest lift on the transmission is to look at some of the, um, well, it's not, and by that I don't mean it's easy, um, but sort of lower hanging fruit might be to look at the different market rules of neighboring electricity markets and seeing sort of what kinds of borders they've sort of set up between each other and is there a way to reduce um, the barriers between those markets for more freely shared power. Um, the next more difficult thing is transmission siting. So there, it, there's probably a good need for that, both for to bring offshore wind onto to shore or to bring sort of, for instance, the, the western wind eastward to where there, there are larger population centers. Lots of issues around that. So I'd be happy to talk about the different sort of policy discussions around transmission siting and the different, uh, you know, sort of incentives that have been discussed over the years with very mixed success. Um, but I, I would say both. We should be, we should be, you know, using policies uh, to invest in and drive more innovation in batteries, and we should be trying to figure out how to open up the grid further. Yeah, I, I'll also point out that one of the questions also dealt with, um, you know, talking about green, the uh, green hydrogen or any kind of hydrogen economy is going to require pipelines as well. And so some of the challenges that have been faced by, you know, fossil infrastructure also could be faced by hydrogen as well. It's certainly I've seen that in renewables where transmission to get electricity from where the wind is blowing, where the sun is blowing to where the people are living has still uh, faced some hurdles. Um, couple more questions here, Nico. Did you have anything that you wanted to throw in on that? Well, I just want to add a quick thing. I think I saw that in one question. Uh, I mean, I hope we would have a system where pipelines for natural gas can be used for hydrogen just as well. From a technological point of view, that's no problem at all. You can do it very easily. Uh, we have the infrastructure. A lot of the infrastructure we have today, we could very easily switch from natural gas to hydrogen. Uh, or what I think is much more likely is a mix of the two in some way. Uh, Got, uh, there's some, there, I, I think I want to go with like two more questions. Um, and because uh, I think that's about the time that we have left. Um, so uh, here's a question for Jonathan. Very good discussion. Wondering if you've read Michael Schellenberger's Apocalypse Never book. Um, and perhaps if you haven't, I think the question can still be addressed. And if you feel this observation that overly pessimistic climate forecasts are hurting energy access in developing countries and his suggestion that nuclear power should be a primary focus. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I, I guess I'll, so I have not read the book, um, but I do know Michael Schellenberger's kind of position on this. I, I do think that there's a bit of a, 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 a solution looking, well, I shouldn't frame it that way. I, I think that climate is a, is a much bigger opportunity for building out the power sector than it is a threat to slowing down power sector development if for no other reason than nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement is a potential huge source of capital for these countries. And I'm not expert enough to know whether nuclear is eligible under those, but I kind of defer to my earlier comments that uh, Africa and kind of middle, low income countries in general are difficult places to take on technology risk. Simply the cost of capital is too high. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not super um, optimistic on this notion that um, Africans or other low income countries um, have no stake in the climate uh, uh, debate process mitigation opportunities. And I do think it's a net positive because there's so much financing out there. And, you know, it's part of the gas discussion as well. I think there's, there's lots of eyeballs looking at markets like the United States to figure out just how far can you go with renewables? Like how much can we integrate utility scale renewables? Because much of Africa is already at 70, 80% hydro, and it's going to be a challenge to get full more renewable than that in many places. But. Right. Well, the, um, I'm going to ask one last question, and it's going to, uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to touch upon this. And before I do that, I want to apologize. There's so many good questions in the Q&A, and I'm hoping people will stay and participate in the networking reception and they can find the person they want to ask the question and ask them directly. So um, really for any panelist or any who want to answer, in your opinion, what is the, mo what is the one most important energy policy, technology, organization, trend, or movement that will best enable humanity to reduce the severity of the climate crisis? Can you describe your personal source of optimism in the face of increasing suffering among populations who are prone to heat, flooding, drought, and food scarcity? I'll give you all a second to kind of ponder that. That's a pretty, that's a pretty heavy one. Jonathan, you're, you're on the screen right now, and it seems particularly in the last era, you know, you kind of, in a way, sort of introduced this topic to begin with, um, and uh, sort of the, the challenges being faced in developing countries to begin with it might be exacerbated by climate, and then starting with a much lower resource base for, uh, for productive use of energy. So any thoughts about like what one yeah. thing I think could, could be critical? Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in the, you know, no silver bullet, lots of silver buckshot. And it's a tough time to be optimistic, right? Um, but I do get excited about a lot of small things. I get excited that, um, that this whole productive use angle is really becoming integrated into electrification planning in developing countries. I think you can't really solve your food security problems. You can't really solve your economic development problems without integrating energy into it. And I think there's an understanding that um, the technology has arrived. Um, we have seen the cost drops that Lori has outlined. And um, if we can figure out a way to de-risk investments in ways, someone commented about blended finance. If we can find those types of ways of aligning risk appetite, you know, get the grant mobile, the, the people with high risk appetite, the grant providers, the philanthropy, to take on the highest amount of risk and really start to leverage the big debt uh, providers, be it through the development banks and commercial capital, I do think there's a lot of, of opportunity to bring in low carbon infrastructure um, that, that starts to, at least in the power sector, get us um, to a, a lane on, on climate. But obviously that's just one, one lane. I'll leave it to the others to talk about Any, some points. Anybody else want to take like a very short cut at that? Yeah, I, I would just say uh, there is no one. I, I don't have one thing and I don't think there is one thing. And I think 
that's actually one source of optimism for me, that there are a lot of ways to get at this. Uh, my other sort of main source of optimism is that I started my legal career at the Department of Justice um, and mostly worked on Clean Air Act lawsuits against coal-fired power plants in the early 2000s. And as recently as 2007, you know, natural gas was unheard of as a, as a real competitor, as like a baseload competitor to coal. And looking at the map today versus those plants that we had our lawsuits against, like almost all of them are gone. Like there has been such a huge ground shift in the power sector, which just suggests it's a lot more dynamic of a system than we had known our whole lives until then. So I think there's some optimism there. Thanks. Laurie or Nico, anybody want to take it, take it on? I would say the biggest, the most important thing is all of us as scientists and researchers, but even more as consumers and as voters. I think there's a lot of, there has been a lot of change the last years in, in the US and worldwide. And I think that will make a difference. Uh, and I think that's the one thing that, it's maybe a very cheesy answer, but I think that's the one thing that will change something. Uh, and my piece of hope is, is today's young generation, the youth, including our students. Uh, I, I think they're so much more aware of the urgency than we have ever been. So I think that is for me, something of hope. I get to go last, which basically means I get to say, yeah, what everybody else said. Um, that I think there are, there are, you know, lots of potential avenues for, um, I won't say solutions, but ways to mitigate the damages from climate change. And I am really inspired by young people today who, who have um, taken to this issue in a, in a really deep and meaningful way and are, are challenging the adults around them to affect a change. Um, and if they can just keep that enthusiasm up, I think it will go a long way towards creating policy space and maybe some additional funding for, you know, the, the moon race on the, on the technology side to really make some, some more significant changes. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would really, I wouldn't add to it, I would try to pull it all together and say, I think most people um, were uh, re okay with embracing sort of an optimistic view, but not a single thing, right? And so the portfolio approach, I mean, one of the challenges in people working on energy and climate policy right now is these camps form that says my solution is the only solution and yours isn't worth anything. And that's actually led to impeded progress. And I think, you know, those of us who work at the intersection of policy and, and science see that and understand that there needs to be more dialogue, there needs to be a recognition of a diverse set of approaches to our energy challenges. And so I wanna thank the panel for bringing such great, interesting perspectives to the problem and, and to our audience for incredible questions of which I only scratch the surface. And for that, I apologize. So, so thanks, wonderful panelists and, and what they were able to bring to the conversation.